All right. So let me just introduce you. Um, Stephen Thelke is a geriatric psychiatrist and a health services researcher at the University of Washington. And, the, um, and he is, um, has most recently come over to UW from the VA Puget Sound. So he's got um, expertise in um, all of our co-sponsorships. He conducts research about dementia medications, depression and pain in older adults and the use of monitoring technologies in healthcare. He has um, been doing this lecture for us for, I'm not even sure how long, Stephen, but um, it's always an incredibly informative and update, up-to-date lecture. So we most appreciate your being willing to um, share your expertise again today. Now you can oh, take Great, thanks so much, Barb. Uh, as, as Barb said, well, welcome, welcome, welcome to the series. Uh, I hope that this will be a, a great overview for you. I assume that because you are interested in the field that you already know a lot of this material, um, but it's always good to refresh. And I uh, imagine that you will uh, find uh, new insights during the um, series. Uh, I wanted to give a overview today of uh, dementia with a focus on the, the person-centered part of it. Um, and then the additional lectures uh, will touch on various aspects of dementia uh, with, with a focus on uh, different uh, parts of the problem. But I wanted to set the stage by talking about the entire person in, in dementia care. Um, or an, another uh, title might be, what's different about dementia? Uh, I'm gonna try to suggest initially uh, that dementia is different than other medical conditions uh, because it affects not only the individual's health status, but also their role in the world. Uh, and that if you treat dementia like another medical problem, you will be doing a disservice to both uh, the patient and uh, the medical system, uh, but that if you keep your eye on the whole person, you will uh, be working in the right direction. Um, and I think the uh, additional talks in this series will underline that point. Um, let's see if I can get this to advance here. Uh, here's a, a nice set of resources. Barb mentioned uh, HRSA, and they are the sponsor of this series. And they have a, a variety of dementia uh, modules uh, that you can find at that link if you're interested. Uh, they keep these up to date and they're a, an excellent resource. Uh, you, you can also just search for HRSA dementia if you can't remember the link. So um, th this slide is a, a little bit uh, confusing, but it sums up uh, what I, I wanna uh, it tell you about dementia, uh, which is that dementia is different than other medical conditions. If you were dealing with hypertension or diabetes or hypothyroidism or falls or any other of the common geriatric conditions, it would be very important to understand the full medical context, which is on the bottom of this slide. Uh, kind of what the, the problem is, uh, what the differential diagnosis is, uh, what the causes are biochemically, uh, what the variations are, how to assess it, uh, what the epidemiology is and the natural history. And then you would uh, base your treatment recommendations on all of that knowledge. As, as an example, if you were dealing with diabetes, you would want to understand what causes insulin resistance, uh, who's at risk for insulin resistance, what the genetics of insulin resistance are, what the effects of health on, of, uh, on health of insulin resistance would be, and uh, what the, the various behavioral and medical treatments are that could impact insulin resistance. What's funny about dementia, uh, and the more I, I deal with it, the, the more I appreciate is this is that really you don't need to know the biochemistry or the brain 
uh, chemistry or the physiology of dementia in order to help people with dementia. Um, instead, I think what, what's really important is to remember the person and their world and to understand why dementia is a problem. And when you understand why dementia is a problem for the individual, that leads you to doing the right thing. And even if you were the world expert in the biochemistry of Alzheimer's disease and what causes plaques and tangles and, and other abnormalities, that would not show you the right thing to do. And in fact, what makes you capable of providing good dementia care is your humanity. Um, it's understanding why people face problems, um, how the modern world is constructed, um, and how uh, people can navigate the challenges of the modern world. So I'm certainly not telling you to ignore the facts of this lecture about what causes Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia, but instead I, I do want to underline the fact uh, that what's going to help you help patients with dementia is your heart more than your brain. And I, I know that may, may seem a, a funny point, but I'm gonna, gonna try to uh, de demonstrate it initially through an example and then come back to it at the end. Uh, a, a more concrete way to, to point this out would be to, to notice that if one of your loved ones is vomiting blood, you know, they, they call you up and say, tell you I'm vomiting blood, what you need is medical care. Obviously something is wrong. You want somebody to fix the problem. But if your loved one is having problems remembering and taking care of themselves, what you need is support for the individual. You do not need a medical fix. And I, I, uh, I hope to, to make sense of, of that as we go through. I forgot to mention um, uh, with regard to uh, the, the process today, that if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I Somehow I cannot see the, the, the chat right now. Oh, there we go, or the Q&A. You can either put them in the chat or the Q&A, and I will try to watch those, and um, Barb also will be watching them. So if you have questions, uh, please put them up there, uh, and I will try to address them if they're relevant initially, or I promise not to go um, past the time that we have allotted and we can address any questions at the end. But please feel free to, to type them as we go in case something is not clear or if uh, any of this uh, sparks uh, curiosity about uh, what, uh, what you'd like to know more. So I wanna, I wanna start with a, a scenario uh, and, and then to, to do two more scenarios. So think, think about this realistically, like not hypothetically, like let's say, one of your parents starts to have memory problems um, and they can't remember what, uh, what they did or uh, what pills they've taken and they're a little bit paranoid about things and they're, they uh, can't remember if they have left the burner on and uh, th this is posed as safety risk. So you get a call about your parents and you uh, need to decide what to do. I want you to think, practically what you would do in this scenario. What, what would be your response? Um, and when I uh, am able to get, get feedback in the, the, the real world about this instead of virtually, uh, obviously this uh, ranges considerably, but mainly people wanna keep their parents safe. So how can you ensure that somebody's gonna be watching out for your parent when they seem to pose the safety risk and they don't know what's going on. And your main needs in this setting, oh, there you go, occupational therapist. That's a, a great, great idea. I, I love that suggestion from Mary Lou because that's uh, exactly it. You want somebody who can focus on the individual, how they're doing in their surroundings. The, the answer that I never get is call a doctor uh, because I think everybody understands that, you know, doctors may be good at diagnosing medical things, but this is not a medical problem. This is a social problem related to the individual's function. Um, and you, you can think through the scenario a little bit further. Uh, 
social worker is also exactly it. Uh, social worker, occupational therapist, somebody who can focus on the context of where your parent lives or a caregiver. I mean, the care social worker or occupational therapist is not going to come live with your parent, uh, but a, a social worker, uh, care manager, or occupational therapist might help you refer to some refer uh, care to someone who could provide that care. Uh, the point about having a relative go live with them is a great one, and I, I often raise the question at this point: Would you give up your life to go stay with your parent? And, and that's a great question. Um, sometimes people say, oh yes, at the drop of the hat, I would go live with my parent to, to watch them. Other people say, no way, I'm gonna carry on with my life. And there, there's no right answer there. <laughs> I like that question from, uh, for the answer from Susan, about no, that you wouldn't go, go do that. Um, and then you're thinking about the practicalities, disconnecting the stove, respite care, other, other forms of uh, support. So, Thank you for that, the, the, the fantastic feedback um, about what you would do acutely. And then the, the, the point is, is great about scheduling a doctor's appointment. Like you, you wanna figure this out eventually, but right now you need to solve the problem of your parent being at risk. And redirections, re reminders um, as, as, as another great way to do that. So th those were, were great I I ideas. And then you'd, you'd make an appointment with a um, neuropsychologist. So you wanna sort out what's going on, but right now you've got a problem. And, and I, I'll contra cra contrast that with what I said before about somebody throwing up blood. You wouldn't say, oh, I'm gonna make an appointment with somebody for a week from now because my parent is vomiting blood. You'd say, you know, get them to an emergency room. Uh, and uh, I, I really like your point, Lisa, about uh, FMLA for caregiving. Uh, that if, if you were in this situation, you uh, could take, take on the care yourself and get support from it, for it uh, from your employer uh, in order to take care of this. So cl clearly you've got an issue, you have to deal with it, and it's different than most medical problems that you would deal with. So let, let's say this has progressed further and now your, your parent really needs um, lots more help day-to-day, -day. like they just can't take care of the day-to-day -day activities. They don't remember who you are. Um, they, they can't eat, bathe, dress, toilet without assistance. And now the question is, what do you do? And supposing you're the only one who could care for them, do you quit your job uh, to go take care of them? FMLA is a great idea, but as, as Linda pointed out, it doesn't cover some, some aspects of care and it doesn't go on forever. And you suppose your family, your 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 parent is going to need care for a long time. Um, it it's again a, a big question. Uh, and uh, Karen, I, I like how you pointed out that you may need to put them somewhere. So you could do it yourself. You could quit your job, live with your parent, take on, you know, twenty four seven or you know eight eighteen seven caregiving, or you could find somebody to pay for it. Uh, or, or you could, uh, you know, find a home that, that would be responsible. So once, once again, the issue is not primarily medical. It's about how to help this individual uh, be safe and be supported and be engaged in meaningful activities like uh, day programs, as uh, Lisa mentioned. That's a, an, another great idea. But once again, I, I hope you can uh, re remember uh, what we were talked about before, that it would be a social worker, care manager, or occupational therapist who can help you do this and not a doctor. Uh, I, 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 and Andreas, I, I love your, uh, your point uh, that I, I don't recommend this, obviously, is to drop off your parent at an emergency room and <laughs> refuse, refuse to take them back home, because uh, that, that is uh, often what happens here. So I, I, you know, I don't want to run this into the ground, but I, I think uh, what everybody is recognizing is that the sort of problem that we face with dementia is not primarily, primarily medical in nature. It's social and it's a strain on the people who are supporting the individual with dementia. Uh, 
Thank you for that link to the uh, paid leave law.gov. That, that could be very handy to uh, have. Um, now I, I wanna switch gears a little bit and just get you to imagine what it would be like to live in an entirely different society or um, culture where uh, we no longer have small nuclear families and instead people live together in multi-generational households uh, where there are always people around and that the older members of the family uh, are uh, able to get support from the younger members. Uh, and when those older people uh, have memory problems, somebody else helps them out because it's assumed that's what happens as you get older, uh, but it's not like they have to take care of things on their own. So instead of asking your parent to uh, you know, cook for themselves, you would have other people who are in the household to cook because they're not going off to uh, jobs during the day. This is in, in fact what most of the non-industrialized world looks like. Um, it's a, clearly an overgeneralization, but I, I think it holds. And, and based on the people I've talked to who have lived in both the industrialized world and the non-industrialized world, they'll tell me uh, that as older adults um, in those non-industrialized communities age, they have people there to support them and they don't even have a category for dementia because it's just assumed that people aren't gonna do as well as, as they did when they get older and they'll have memory problems and functional problems. And um, the last thing you would do is take your elderly loved one to a doctor to get a diagnosis. So Scooter, it, it sounds like um, that that's a, an, an idea that people have tried in the UK also, um, and, and it's one that, that might work here as well. And, and I, I, I don't um, want to uh, you know, expand too much on this, but what, what I wanna uh, point out is that dementia is a social and cultural problem for us. It's not primarily a medical problem. Uh, it's not like cancer or diabetes or heart disease, uh, where you know it does depend on you know, diet and other other factors, but they're mainly medical problems. The problem with dementia is that we just don't have enough people around to help the people with dementia, uh, and that is not going to be solved anytime soon. And it will continue to be a, a problem in our civilization uh, as long as we live in fragmented uh, nuclear families uh, where the children often go off and live elsewhere. Uh, not passing judgment on uh, moving away from your parents, clear, clearly, uh, but it does lead to uh, certain challenges when people don't uh, live all together. All right, so, so that was the, the, the very uh, broad background. I wanna get a, a little more nitty gritty and go through some of the details of uh, what dementia is as a condition, and then uh, talk about the subtypes of dementia. I, I assume you've all seen people uh, who, who have dementia um, and, and you know what it's like, and I'm not gonna um, try to alter that very much because, uh, D dementia is is not a uh, very confusing thing. I mean, once once you've seen somebody who has progressive memory decline and they're older, you usually are accurate in calling it dementia. But I want to point out some important uh, exclusions or exemptions to that, and also uh, clear up some common misconceptions about what dementia might be. So I, I have three definitions of dementia. Um, I want to go through each in turn. Each of them covers a slightly different angle. The first one uh, is uh, mainly a, a diagnosis or a, a definition of exclusion. Uh, so you can think about what uh, the, the key terms rule out. Uh, so it is that dementia is a significant chronic loss of memory and or mental functioning that involves structural damage to the brain. 
So significant here means that it actually involves uh, changes in functioning. So it's not just a subjective sense of memory problem. It's not just doing poorly on a memory test. It actually has consequences for the individual's life. It's chronic. It doesn't come on quickly. So if somebody was okay a month ago and now they can't do anything, that's not dementia. Um, and you, you have to, to make sure you sort that out. It's a loss, which means that the individual used to be able to do all of these mental functions and now they can't. It involves memory and or mental functioning. It's not just memory. And we'll see one of the forms of dementia, frontotemporal dementia that in initially involves uh, mainly uh, judgment uh, and insight rather than memory. And then the, the last point is important mainly to differentiate dementia from other psychiatric diseases. We don't know what causes all the, the psychiatric diseases, but our best model is really that it's neurotransmitters, or at least we tell ourselves that, that somebody has a deficiency in a certain neurotransmitter or how that neurotransmitter is cleared off by the brain. Um, and because the neurotransmitter levels are off, the individual has anxiety, depression, psychosis, uh, obsessiveness, uh, or, or any other difficulties. Whereas in, in dementia, the brain cells are actually dying. Um, and th this is, is kind of kind of funny, um, and we don't focus on it very much, but it really is crucial when you think about what you're going to do with dementia. It's not just a chemical abnormality. The, the brain cells are actually dying in dementia. And I will try to show you evidence of, of that soon. So th this uh, definition is important for telling you what dementia is not. Uh, the, the other definition of dementia that people often use is a progressive neurodegenerative condition with functional consequences. And this is kind of bland, lots of uh, many syllable words in there. Uh, but what it, what it tells you is that it is progressive. It's going to get worse. It's neurodegeneration, your, your brain cells are dying, and it has effects on how you function. It's not just how you feel or, or how you do on a test. Um, it's not a lifelong condition. If you had a lifelong cognitive impairment, that would be classified as a cognitive deficit, uh, such as developmental delay. It doesn't happen abruptly. It's a, a slow and steady change. It's different than normal aging, which involves some changes to how you think and react. And the other lectures in the series will cover that. And it is not just an insignificant or a trivial problem because it involves functioning. But at the same time, um, dementia is uh, not necessarily a, a problem uh, with your memory. It can involve other forms of cognition. It's not necessarily Alzheimer's or other uh, specific types of dementia. It does not necessarily involve behavioral problems. Uh, that's not part of any of these definitions. Um, it does not necessarily have to be age-related, although as we'll see, it, it tends to come on after age 65. And it's not necessarily a fatal condition, although uh, people often um, you know, do die uh, during dementia, which doesn't mean that it was the dementia that was the fatal condition. These are the, the formal criteria, uh, which simply reinforce what I talked about before. This is from DSM-5, which is considered the um, kind of Bible of psychiatry. And it uh, has certain criteria that are necessary for diagnosing the condition. There has to be a decline in various domains that are listed at the bottom of the slide. There have to be functional problems and their um, problems can't be due to delirium or another me mental disorder. The, the domains of cognition really aren't that important and you can kind of sort these out that there are different uh, aspects of how uh, the, the brain works and how it deals with certain uh, information processing problems. Importantly for uh, how DSM-5 puts together 
all of the diagnosis. Uh, the, the diagnosis is uh, technically uh, required to be either possible or probable. So there does remain a lot of uncertainty about dementia. It's not like when you diagnose this, everybody is uh, going to be confident. So even at best, you would say it's a probable diagnosis. And if there's less certainty, you would say it's possible. And the, the other talks in this series will cover the uh, uncertainty. Uh, behavioral disturbance is categorized as a separate entity. So it's not necessarily that if you have dementia, you're going to have behavioral disturbance. You may or may not have it. And then uh, most importantly, the severity of dementia is based on the functional status. It is not based on a score on a cognitive test or on how much you can remember. It's based on how you function day to day in the real world. So mild dementia, according to DSM-5, is where you can't take care of the more complex activities of daily living. Moderate dementia is where you can't do the basic ADLs like grooming, uh, to toileting, uh, I, finding food, uh, all, all the, the basic ADLs. And then severe dementia is where you are fully dependent in all your activities of daily living and require someone else to do them. So well, once again, uh, the, the, the key point here is that the severity of dementia and in fact, even the basic diagnosis of dementia depend on uh, the functional status of the individual. So as, as you talk to people who have dementia or you suspect have dementia, what you really wanna focus on is their functional status. And the best way to get at that is not to ask the patient themselves, but rather to ask a, a collateral source, um, whether the individual is having problems. And the, the key question that, that I've found over the years has the most relevance is to ask somebody else, like a spouse, are there things that the patient used to do for themselves that now you have to do for them? Uh, and if they say no, like, no, they can still do all their own stuff, then you have to wonder, is this dementia? But if they say, oh yes, they they quit driving three years ago and they quit balancing the checkbook two years ago, that's much more suggestive. So, so great, great question about whether the MOCA is invalid. Um, I would not say it's invalid, instead it is insufficient because what you really are looking for is functional changes and simply based on a test score, you cannot say whether someone has dementia or not. That's a, a really great, great question. And um, it's one of the, the subtleties that I wanted to point out today about how you assess for dementia, that you can't go out and just give people a cognitive test and, and say whether they do or don't have dementia, because the, the crucial break point be between likely dementia and maybe or unlikely dementia is their functional status. And, and the best way to get at that is to talk to the people they live with rather than to test the individual. Really, really great question. So th this is, is going to be addressed in much more detail by uh, Dr. Trichu uh, during her upcoming talk, but I wanted to uh, give a, a sneak preview for it about two, two of the main rule outs uh, with uh, dementia diagnosis that often look like dementia um, and that are difficult as a snapshot uh, as, as you pointed out with that question, if you gave somebody a MOCA and they got 15 out of 30, you may say, well, you know, there's a problem, but you wouldn't necessarily know if it's any of these three. So delirium is uh, also known as acute brain failure. Acute brain failure, it's where uh, if people stop thinking clearly, it's due to a medical cause. Uh, the most common one in older adults is uh, medication side effects. Uh, the second most common is infections, especially urinary tract infection or a subacute pneumonia. Uh, delirium comes and goes. Uh, 
it, so sometimes people are very clear, other times they're not clear, and mainly they're confused. Uh, but if you give them a cognitive test, uh, then they uh, will, will do poorly, obviously, because they are confused. Uh, dementia, as we, we talked about, uh, is chronic and progressive. Uh, it involves uh, specific domains of functioning um, and it involves functional decline as, as I have uh, hammered home multiple times. Uh, and then delir uh, depression can look like uh, either of these because it can involve people who aren't thinking straight. Uh, but typically when you test them and you can get their attention, they will do okay on cognition. So it, it's important if you have somebody who presents with cognitive problems to look at each of these. So great question from uh, Linda about the FAST scale. So the, the FAST is in fact a functional assessment scale roughly correlates to what I was talking about before. And that is a reasonable way to, to go about assessing cognition. But as you may guess, the, the, the way you um, administer the FAST is not by just talking to the patient. Instead, you get a global assessment of their functional status. Yeah, great question, Linda. So um, real, real quickly on uh, how often dementia happens. Um, the, the, the funny thing about dementia that sometimes people forget, uh, and when I, I ask the, the residents and even our uh, fellows about this, I'll say, what's the main risk factor for dementia? And they'll you know, think about it and say, you know, is it like you know, obesity or low education or poor diet? And what, what's easy to forget is that the main risk factor for dementia is age. So it's very unlikely in middle-aged or young people, incredibly unlikely in young people, uh, very unlikely in middle-aged people, but pretty common in older people. So the single biggest factor, uh, risk factor for getting dementia is being older. And after your, after, about age 80, um, it's really relatively common. So uh, kind of a, a, a funny one when you think about it, like why is this? How does this work? And I've spent uh, you know, over, over a, a decade or, or more thinking about it and I still have no good answer. You know, like, what is it that exactly causes people to uh, be at risk for dementia only after about age 65? And if, if you've got an answer for that, please, uh, you know, let me know and or publicize it because it would be a major contribution to the field. Here's a, a good example of uh, how that applies uh, across the world. Uh, these are, are all Western societies, but what they show is that even in, in Europe, different parts of Europe and um, different parts of the United States, the prevalence of dementia roughly is, is uh, identical uh, and that it follows this exponential pattern. So very rare but before age 65, a little more common in the 70s, but then by the time you hit 90, it really is very common. And there's a, a whole equation if you're into this, it's called the Brookmeyer equation that gives an actual uh, numerical value to this. But th this is just to suggest that um, dementia really does occur uh, predictably across societies. I want to want to turn now to the subtypes of dementia. I don't don't want to belabor this. Um, probably, th as you're thinking about the subtypes, this is the most important uh, figure. And what what it shows is that there is a lot of overlap between dementia types. It's not like you're dealing with just one or the other type. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is the most common, it's the biggest circle there, but Alzheimer's overlaps a huge amount with vascular dementia. Lewy body overlaps a lot with Alzheimer's disease. The other forms on there, including uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus, NPH, which we won't talk about. FTD is frontotemporal. And then the other kind of rare forms such as infectious or toxic uh, dementias, also overlap with uh, Alzheimer's disease and with the other forms. So 
That, that's a great question from AG there. Yes, people often do have multiple types of dementia. And one, one of the things I learned from working at the VA where I would diagnose people with Alzheimer's and then feel smug about myself and then they would come in a year later and show symptoms of Lewy body or other forms of dementia. And I would kick myself saying, you know, why did I miss this? And in fact, I was missing the simple point that I was trying to make all along uh, which is that the types of dementia frequently overlap. And that's something that we don't fully understand. Uh, although with fronto or uh, with vascular and Alzheimer's, we, we do know a little bit more about how that happens. And yes, uh, great question, Cricket, that yes, the symptoms are often the same. And that's what makes it very difficult to sort them out. But as I'll try to suggest, to suggest it really doesn't even matter that much uh, because the management strategies aren't that much different. Uh, once again, you're supporting the individual. You're thinking about where the individual is coming from, what their world is like, who the people around them are like, and uh, whether you label it um, as vascular or Alzheimer's or Lewy body is much less important than understanding them and their world. Great, great question there uh, too. And, and great question about the multiple types. So this uh, very quick, uh, quickly is uh, the, the brain. I, <laughs> I assume you know that uh, and what the, the lobes are. Uh, so the yellow lobe here is the frontal lobe. Uh, it's the one that's the biggest in human beings. It, but this is a picture of other mammals. It would be a lot smaller. Uh, the kind of pinkish lobe on the top is the parietal lobe. The blue one is the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is mainly uh, vision related. The uh, pur purple lobe is uh, temporal lobe. And then at the very bottom is the cerebellum. So uh, Alzheimer's disease is mainly a parietotemporal problem involving the pink and purple lobes, but with global uh, deterioration across all the, the, the lobes uh, and mainly at the, the surface of them. Uh, but it's not like there is any single location. So uh, un unfortunately, uh, it's not like you can point to any specific space in the brain and say this is where Alzheimer's or any other form of dementia comes from. All right, so I, I, I want to go, go through these very quickly. I assume this is largely review for you. Um, and if you have questions about the, the types, please let me know. But I want to make sure we have plenty of time at the end for questions. So going to go through uh, these, these five types of dementia. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, if you're interested in the history, it really is fascinating. Uh, it's only about 100 years ago that, that Alois Alzheimer, uh, they were left on, on the left, identified uh, these characteristic uh, findings in the brain of people who had a, a weird form of dementia. On the top right is his first patient, Auguste Dieter. Uh, who was different than the other patients who had cognitive problems at the time. Most of them had neurosyphilis, which is the, the disease that filled up the um, institutions during that time period. And Auguste Dieter uh, had a different form of cognitive problems compared to the people with neurosyphilis. And when Alzheimer looked at her brain uh, after she died, these are the findings that, that he, he identified. They were uh, plaques and tangles. So the plaques are outside the cell. They are made of a misfolded amyloid protein. The tangles are made of a chemical called tau that is part of the skeleton, of the, the backbone of the uh, cell. Uh, neither amyloid nor tau are, are foreign chemicals. They occur everywhere in the body but they are unusual forms uh, in Alzheimer's that clump together, and then you can see them on a microscope. This slide uh, is a uh, over optimistic uh, interpretation of how you start with regular amyloid precursor protein that's APP, break it up, and uh, then get the uh, plaques and tangles, and the things in it Italics are the drugs that are supposed to help uh, stop the process. If only this worked so great, we would have cured Alzheimer's 40 years ago. Unfortunately, uh, none of it works as planned. And uh, despite a lot of hype, there still really are no great uh, ways that we could stop the process. And even if we had them, they would require 
decades of treatment for asymptomatic people. So not, not to, uh, to go over this too much, but um, this is just to say that we understand some of how people get plaques and tangles, but we really don't know the whole process. The, the key to, to all this um, in terms of managing dementia is to remember that in dementia, people, people's neurons have died. It's not like they simply are suffering from a shortage of a neurotransmitter. They have in fact deteriorated. If you look at the, the picture on the left, that's a CT of somebody with dementia and on the right is a normal brain. You can see that it is shrunken. The area that's particularly shrunken is the uh, inferior hypothalamus uh, where, it, or, or the inferior temporal lobes where the hypothalamus is located. And that, that for whatever reason tends to be the, the site where there is most deterioration. If you look at the bottom of the, the color picture, you can see that things are very thinned out there. And there's a little area there that looks kind of like a seahorse. Uh, and that's the um, hippocampus, which is where uh, memory is processed. The, as, as I started with, you can spend a lot of time learning about uh, the brain anatomy, but it really won't help you help people with dementia. Uh, so great, great question about um, epilepsy or traumatic brain injury. Uh, so as I'll point out with regard to uh, vascular dementia, if you have a localized deficit in your brain, that is very different than dementia because dementia is a generalized deterioration. However, uh, people who have brain injury are at a higher risk for degenerative brain disorders. Uh, and uh, if you have had multiple head injuries, you are definitely at a higher risk for any form of dementia. Frontotemporal dementia is a separate category. It is not uh, caused uh, by specific uh, forms of uh, in insult or injury. Instead, it's a set of uh, chemical changes that happen in the brain that involve chemical uh, building up. Uh, people who have chronic recurrent head injuries, like people with what's called CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, like in football players or boxers, um, are at risk for dementia, but that formally is not categorized as FTD, which is a, a separate uh, type of uh, problem. So great, great question, Linda. So I'm, I'm glad to, to start off clarifying that. So Alzheimer's uh, quickly is a slow, steady decline in functioning. It involves functional changes, as we talked about before. Uh, you have to look out for other causes of these changes, including delirium, which I mentioned, people with sleep apnea or who have uh, other sensory deficits uh, or depression can have uh, difficulties of this type. PTSD is also a, a major cause. And I know this will be addressed in the, the remainder of the series. Um, if you have Alzheimer's, you have a slow, steady decline. So people generally don't present until two to three years until they have problems. Uh, the patient generally is unaware of the, their difficulties. Of, of the hundreds of patients I saw with Alzheimer's over the years, uh, almost all of them, when I would ask how they were, would say, I'm fine. I don't have any problems. No big deal. And then I would talk to their families, and obviously it was a big deal. Uh, but the, the patient typically has little insight or awareness. Uh, usually people wait a number of years until they get care. Every day is about the same. And the total uh, time frame between diagnosis and death is about a decade, maybe a little, little bit more or less. But it's a slow and steady process, which makes it especially difficult. Uh, this is a, a very rough perspective on the, the degrees of Alzheimer's. Uh, don't don't uh, take this literally. Uh, typically, people have mild problems at first, difficulty taking care of daily activities. They do a little bit poorly on uh, testing in a moderate stage, three to six years in, uh, they have much, much more functional problem. 
uh, and they, they may show um, psychiatric symptoms when they know that something's wrong, but they can't quite figure it out. And then the severe stage, uh, which is the last three or four years of the, the disease, uh, they have problems with language, uh, oftentimes have behavioral dysregulation where they um, get uh, agitated for, for no good reason. And then at the very end of the disease, uh, the degeneration is not just in the cortex or the, the functional or memory centers, but even in the, the basic uh, motor centers. Uh, and if somebody has no other health problems, eventually they will die uh, of uh, aspiration because they don't protect their airway. So uh, it, it's a, a slow, steady process. There's, there's no uh, textbook approach to it. And the, the Alzheimer's Association has a nice line that I used to think was a little too cute, but I think really is true, which is when you've seen one case of Alzheimer's, you've seen one case. You, you really can't generalize. There are some people who retain their personality and uh, language abilities and other people who um, don't and who, who change a bunch. So you can't make assumptions about how things are going to go. So great question, Susan, about uh, COPD and chronic hypoxia. Uh, I, I won't belabor this, but, but basically what, what I have uh, found is that people with chronic hypoxia have cognitive problems, but not deterioration. And there is some work uh, that I've, I've done and others have done that suggests that lower oxygen levels might be protective against dementia. So people with COPD uh, are underrepresented in dementia clinics, which is funny. So who, who would have thought that COPD might be uh, protective? It's clearly not good for how your brain works day to day, but it may stop you from getting this chronic and progressive deterioration. So I, uh, if, if you want to know more, please, please email me because that's a, a fascinating topic and I'm glad you brought that up. So uh, Al Alzheimer's disease, uh, people are often worried about uh, their loved ones getting it. Uh, if people are under age 60, uh, it's much more uh, related to the genetics, but most of Alzheimer's disease is not early. It's late onset, sporadic. And if you have a loved one with dementia, it does not mean that you're gonna get dementia. And your, your risk is slightly increased, but it's not hugely increased. And uh, most of Alzheimer's disease is due to random changes that we don't really understand yet. So you, you may ask then, why is there more Alzheimer's disease now? And, and the, the simple answer is that we live a lot longer than people did 100 or 200 years ago. So as life expectancy has increased, for a disease that is primarily age-related, you are obviously going to get a lot more cases. Uh, so once again, the, the top graph is life expectancy by age for the last 120 years, and the bottom graph is the incidence of the disease by age. So if people are dying before age 70, you're going to see very little of it. If people live to 90, you're going to see a ton of it. Uh, you don't need to posit another cause, such as an environmental cause or behavioral one. You may also wonder, can you prevent Alzheimer's? Uh, have bad, bad news here. Uh, unfortunately, the, the better, uh, you know, better done studies don't point to any specific uh, things that you could do to protect yourself against Alzheimer's. This is sad in a way but also it's uh, somewhat reassuring because when somebody gets dementia, you, you don't wanna blame them for it. Uh, I've had patients at the VA who were vegetarians, non-smokers, non-drinkers, marathon runners, uh, who looked better at age 70 than I did at age 30, uh, who got dementia. I'll give you a couple of examples uh, in a second. Um, and obviously there were plenty of patients who had uh, diabetes and were overweight and never exercised once in their lives who didn't get dementia. So it's not to say that lifestyle doesn't impact dementia, but it's not a clear association. Uh, great question about uh, diagnosis. Yes, this is a, a fascinating topic. Um, 
and it, and it has a lot to do with uh, implicit bias. And uh, if, if you want to know more, let, let me know, because I can send you some references about uh, how people get labeled as having dementia, especially people who probably don't have dementia uh, in certain race ethnic groups who are uh, categorized as having dementia, even though they, they may have other conditions. Great question. So this is an example of two, two recent world leaders, uh, questionable politics, but clearly very smart and healthy people both of whom got dementia. They may have had dementia, early dementia in this picture, uh, Ronald Reagan and uh, Margaret Thatcher. This is Claude Shannon, who is uh, like the, uh, basically the inventor of modern computing, who got Alzheimer's disease despite being an incredibly healthy, unbelievably smart guy. Uh, so it, it, his uh, hobbies were riding a unicycle and playing chess. And you can see how good, good he looked. Um, even into later life, uh, but um, did not protect him against uh, getting uh, Alzheimer's disease. All right, so vascular dementia is, is a little bit uh, funny uh, because you can lump it in your mind with Alzheimer's. Uh, it's a different pathology in the, the brain, but really it's the same presentation. The most important thing about vascular is that it's not strokes. If somebody has strokes, like the, the question uh, bef before about uh, frontal strokes, if somebody has a stroke, their, their brain continues to remodel. It works around the stroke. Uh, at the, at, oftentimes there's improvement after the stroke, but it's not like you're on this downward slide. And yet with vascular dementia, which is changes in the very small blood vessels, you continue to get a worsening over time. And we don't fully understand how this happens. Uh, why is it that people who have these small vessel changes get a, a syndrome like, like Alzheimer's? And more importantly, why is it that when you um, correct the underlying problem, like you fix their blood pressure, you fix their cholesterol, you fix their blood sugar, you stop them from smoking, they still continue to worsen. And I, this is, is one of the great mysteries for me um, as to why uh, vascular changes would cause a problem that becomes progressive, uh, but it probably has to do with uh, what's called the uh, amyloid angiopathy that develops where people uh, have changes in their small blood vessels uh, that then result in worsening and worsening changes. And that probably is similar to what happens in Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's and vascular disease probably coalesce at some point with the same kind of uh, brain deficit. This is, is a kind of a, a tricky slide, but, but the, the point here is that somebody on the upper left had a major stroke and somebody uh, on the right had small vessel changes. And if you can trust me on this one, the person with the small vessel changes on the right actually does worse in the long run than the person who had the big stroke on the left. I know this may be hard to, to palate, but the, the point is that if you have vascular dementia, you're going to continue to have uh, degenerative changes. Whereas if you have a stroke, you have a fixed problem. And if you don't have more strokes, you're not going to continue to worsen. This is a, a reminder about um, the, what's called the nun study, where basically they, they found that the nuns who had vascular pathology during life were uh, are much more likely to have uh, functional problems than the ones who had pure Alzheimer's pathology. And it's uh, it was basically suggestion that uh, all of dementias are vascular somehow in nature. Then there were a bunch of nuns who had only Alzheimer's pathology. And then after uh, they died, uh, you know, they found that they had Alzheimer's pathology, but a large number of them had no cognitive problems during life. So the plaques and tangles probably are less important than the vascular changes. So a great question about, uh, Fasting, uh, and I, I, I like that that answer. Oh, oh, never, never. I don't think the answer is about that. <laughs> but basically, nobody's sorted that out. There are surrogate markers for 
Alzheimer's and other uh, risks like plaques and tangles. Uh, as far as I know, nobody has done a good study looking at fasting and, and those markers. And uh, even if they did make a difference in those markers, it's unclear if they would have an impact on the cognitive outcomes. Uh, there are plenty of people who consider Alzheimer's disease to be a form of diabetes, which may make sense based on what I was saying about the vascular risks, uh, like that it's diabetes type three, but this has, has not really been supported scientifically. Uh, great question about the fasting. Uh, and then about COVID, I wish I, wish I knew, um, you know, there, it just, just for your curiosity, I, if you have PubMed, you might search for the word COVID in PubMed. Uh, or COVID dementia. The last I checked, there were 130,000 articles about COVID that have been published since COVID started. Uh, you couldn't read them even if you read it like an article every 10 seconds. Um, and the, the ones about dementia are numerous also, but unfortunately, none of them point in any clear direction. Gr great question. And it, and it could be that COVID uh, actually does set you up for dementia, but I assume it'll take a while to figure that out. All right, I wanna turn quickly to the, the other remaining types of dementia. Lewy body is an important one to, uh, to know about. Basically, Lewy body uh, resembles Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's, which I, I assume you've, you have seen, has motor symptoms, uh, tremor especially, slow movements, people have a stooped posture, shuffling gait, what's called a masked facies. Um, and unlike Alzheimer's, it's not mainly in the outside part of the brain, it's throughout the brain. Um, people with Lewy body dementia often have uh, visual hallucinations, which is very unusual in psychiatry. So if you see someone who has visual hallucinations, especially hallucinations that are not particularly distressing, like, oh yeah, I see those weird animals over there, but they don't bother me. Um, you wanna think about Lewy body dementia. It's one of the, the forms of dementia that's easy to miss. Um, and as I, I mentioned, I had patients often at the, the VA who, whom I would see, think they had Alzheimer's. And then a year later, they would come in with these other findings. And I would say, how did I miss this? And it's just that they present later. Uh, and most importantly, uh, you wanna make sure that uh, you don't give antipsychotics to patients with Lewy body dementia because it can significantly worsen the problem. Uh, oftentimes these, these patients um, have other forms of cognitive difficulty besides memory. Uh, so they would have problems with sequencing or multitasking and then only later in the disease, uh, they would have uh, difficulties uh, with mem memory. But very important to, to know that Lewy body exists. Frontotemporal dementia is considerably rarer. You may never see it uh, unless you work at a specialty memory clinic. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, it's a specific set of changes, most of them involving the protein tau. Uh, and if you've seen people who have frontal head injuries, uh, it initially uh, mimics that. So there's disinhibition, personality changes, uh, apathy, and, but with intact memory. And then later on, people develop memory problems and uh, problems with day-to-day uh, -day functioning. So the presentation is a little bit different in frontotemporal than in Alzheimer's uh, dementia, uh, because in Alzheimer's, you get functional and memory problems initially, and in FTD, you get personality changes, and later on, you get uh, problems with memory and uh, functioning. This is a, a picture of somebody with F frontotemporal dementia. Uh, you can kind of, uh, you can see obviously on the, the right side of the slide, I hope you can tell that that brain is unhealthy. So that's the, the frontal lobes on the right, and you can tell they're de deteriorated. Uh, and then over time, the deterioration progresses back. So at first it's the personality centers, apathy, complex reasoning, and then over time you get more of the association cortex and memory and then eventually visual changes. 
frontotemporal dementia is much more genetically uh, linked than is Alzheimer's or vascular or Lewy body. And uh, oftentimes uh, comes on or generally starts earlier also. So in the 50s, age 50s, or even 40s, and people will often have a first degree relative, such as a parent who also had frontotemporal dementia. So if, if you have somebody who's, who's acting strange or shows poor, in it, poor judgment or disinhibition, you don't wanna diagnose them with the frontotemporal because they probably just have a poor judgment, uh, but it, it is an, an important one to, to know about um, as a rare form of dementia. I'm gonna not talk about these in detail, except to note that most of the forms of dementia that we would call reversible uh, are actually not dementia at all based on the definition that I presented before. They are medical problems that involve cognitive deficit. So they're medical issues that make your brain not work properly. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is a relatively common one where the uh, ventricles in the brain, the fluid collections in the brain don't drain properly and squeeze the brain. Uh, alcohol can be associated with cognitive problems. There's all sorts of other uh, deficiencies uh, and uh, toxicities that uh, can happen as well as infectious agents. Uh, I, I wouldn't spend my time you know, mastering this list other than to uh, recognize that there are cognitive problems associated with uh, medical conditions. And in the old days, it may have mattered to pay attention to these. Although uh, nowadays you really can't set foot in a hospital uh, without uh, having most of these ruled out because common labs uh, would tell you whether uh, these are present or not. And if you had some abnormal presentation that didn't show up on labs, such as Lyme disease, uh, there's enough attention to, to that to um, bring it uh, to uh, diagnostic consideration. So I, I'm just uh, pointing out that most of, you know, the vast majority of the forms of dementia that you will see relate to Alzheimer's, Lewy body, vascular, uh, dementia, once in a while frontotemporal dementia, but you don't need to spend your time mastering all these rare forms because you, you typically would know about them in advance. So what do you, what do, you do if you've got somebody who has cognitive impairment? Uh, you, you really just want to get a good history. That, that, that's crucial. Um, figuring out when the cognitive problem started, how it's progressed, what the functional changes are. Uh, does it wax and wane? Did it, did it come on very quickly? Are there any other causes? And uh, how does it fit with the overall picture? And the, the more it fits with a slow steady decline, the less workup you do, the more weird findings there are, like if you know somebody has paralysis or if you know they have problems only every other week, the more workup you want to do. Most of the labs uh, are, are very basic. You don't need to, to do a bunch of extra labs. And imaging like CAT scan and MRI are still not routinely recommended because they just don't add that much. This, this is always funny to me because you think, you know, we have the ability to take these very cool pictures of people's brains, but actually it doesn't help you to identify dementia that much. So gr great question about American diet. Um, and as, as I pointed out uh, with that, that slide about different cultures around the world, the single biggest risk, risk factor for dementia is age rather than diet or behavioral factors. And you, you'd think that with all the you know, bad uh, diets there are in different parts of the world that you would get greatly increased risks of dementia, but actually that has not panned out and that uh, research by the National Institutes of Aging that I, I cited uh, earlier did not provide evidence for diet as being a uh, significant protective factor against dementia. So it's, uh, once again, it's one of those things that you'd think would, would make sense that if, if 
people had a, a better or worse diet, they would have more or less risk of dementia. But so far that has not panned out. And in parts of the world where people have very healthy diets or for individuals who have very healthy diets, they still have a considerable risk of dementia. It's a bummer. I, 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 you know, the, the more I work in this field, the more I wish there was something I could do to prevent myself from getting dementia, but uh, I, I have not come across that yet. So I would just wanna, wanna point out this, this uh, quickly about uh, cognitive testing. Uh, it, it will come up later, but just as a, as a reminder, um, this is the mini mental status exam, which is not used that much, but uh, what, what I want to suggest is that the, the score on the mini mental depends on your age and your education. So if you are higher age and lower education, you can get a low score and still be what would be considered normal. Uh, that's in the upper right slide. Uh, and if you're younger and have higher education, you expect a higher score. So you, if you have dementia, your score on a 30 point uh, scale is going to drop about three points per year. Um, and if you don't have dementia, as you can see by looking at these age categories, you'd expect you know, no more than one point drop per year or maybe even one point per every five years. So what, once, once again, if you really want to assess somebody's cognitive decline, you need to assess them over time. Uh, so, so great, great questions ab about uh, diet. Uh, yeah, diabetes is associated with higher risks of dementia, but as that NIA report points out, the interventions that uh, involve tighter glycemic control, uh, like people who were able to keep their A1Cs lower, did not actually show lower incidence of dementia, which is kind of weird. Like you'd think that if it was a risk factor for vascular dementia, if you could lower your A1C, you, you would uh, probably have a lower rate of dementia, but that did not really pan out. Um, and and I, I'd agree with you, uh, Jennifer, that, that there is, is not uh, great evidence uh, supporting the association between diet and overall dementia risk. And if, if you know otherwise, please let me know because uh, it would be very important to know, uh, you know, that the Mediterranean diet and, and alcohol consumption and all those factors have received a lot of attention because people, you know, would like to make different recommendations. Uh, but in, in terms of generalized findings, it is simply uh, not held up. In terms of the, the, the products that are supposed to help memory, Maybe they work great, maybe they don't. They just have not been subject to scientific investigation. And when the NIA did that report that, that I cited, uh, they simply did not find clear scientific evidence of any uh, product or pharmaceutical of any type that would help to prevent dementia. So it would, it would be great if we came up with one um, and there's obviously a lot of interest and a lot of money at, at stake in this, uh, but so far there is simply no good recommendation. All right, real, real quickly on another couple tests that you wanna know about, the clock drawing test. This one seems ridiculously um, simplified in a way, uh, but it's worth knowing about in case you're assessing people with cognitive uh, challenges. Uh, it's very fast, very easy. Basically what you do is ask, ask people to remember three things and then have them draw a clock face. And each of the three things is worth one point and the clock face is worth two points, uh, no partial credit on the clock. If they get the clock just fine, they get two points. If they make any error, it's zero points and you get one point per item. If somebody gets uh, three, four or five, you basically consider it to be okay if they get a zero, one or two, then there's a problem. Three is kind of equivocal, but if somebody gets four or five, you assume their cognition is okay. Uh, despite its simplicity, this one really is quite good at differentiating people who have progressive decline and people who don't. Uh, I wanna cover real, real quickly the issue of screening. So let, let's say you had a, a uh, the idea that you wanted to find people with dementia so that you could intervene with them and you had a blood test 
Uh, I'm not going to go through the math, but if you're interested, please do it on your own. And this is an actual article that came up with it. it said it was 90% accuracy. If you've got 90% accuracy, that's 90% uh, sensitivity and specificity. Uh, what you what you find if you run the numbers is that you still end up miscategorizing a huge amount of people, and you end up telling a bunch of people that they have dementia when they don't. So of the people who get a positive test for dementia, two out of three of them will not actually have dementia, even with this 90% positive test. So you have to be very careful when you have a screening test. And in fact, uh, the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommends against screening for dementia for this reason, because uh, it's not uh, appropriately uh, accurate. It's not specific enough to help you define it. So this is, is just a summary. The, the way we find dementia now, uh, based on recommendations, is to wait for people to come in to talk about problems. So I, I've gotten very technical. I want to loop back again to why dementia is a problem and why how we can help people with it. Basically, it's a problem because people cannot satisfy their role in the world anymore when they get dementia and other people have to help them. So when you're helping the patient, you're mainly helping the caregiver and helping the environment to support the patient. This is a great book uh, about the challenges with dementia caregiving. If, if you have any, anybody you know or personally you're, you're in this situation, I'd recommend it. Uh, 36 hour day it nicely sums up the challenge. Uh, if you just listen to people about their caregiving challenges, uh, if you uh, talk to family and uh, caregivers about their their own burdens, why it's hard to be a caregiver, uh, identify if they're depressed and then refer them if at all possible to the supports in the community, including the Alzheimer's Association, all the uh, services that exist in the county, and then if people can afford it, private social workers can be a huge benefit. This loops back to what we talked about very initially about what you would do if it was your parents um, and uh, that you would want something like a social worker, OT, or caregiver, or a, a care coordinator. So a great question, Lisa, about not screening for dementia. The um, the, the rationale for not screening for dementia is that you end up with a bunch of false positives. Obviously, you want to ask people about their functioning, ask how they're doing day to day. But in terms of going out and looking for dementia, it is uh, not high enough yield that it's worth doing. Um, and if you do do it, you end up with all sorts of, of problems. Um, and I, I'd encourage you, if, uh, if, if you wonder about that, to do the math to see all the, num the numbers of people who would, uh, don't have dementia, who would actually be told they have dementia, and what the consequences of that would be. So obviously, I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't ask people about how they're functioning, but that you work more from what we call warning signs of dementia, rather than going out and testing people and saying, oops, you, know, you got a 22, therefore we think you have dementia. And there is really no way to uh, backtrack from that. Great, great question. Um, so uh, agitation is going to be addressed uh, again later. I just want to highlight now that, that you, if somebody's agitated, you want to figure out why. Don't just treat them. Uh, the, the main reasons that there, as I listed, are being delirious. If they've got unmet needs, if they're hot, cold, too wet. Uh, hungry, thir thirsty, uh, in pain, uh, that'll make people agitated. If they're rewarded for being agitated or if they think they're doing the right thing, like if somebody comes at you when you're sitting here and tries to take your clothes off you, obviously you're gonna protect yourself and defend yourself. We call it agitation, but from the patient's perspective, it's just self-defense. So that it's most crucial if somebody's agitated in the setting of dementia to figure out why. And then 
and antipsychotic medications are used often for agitation, but they technically have a black box warning. And I'd encourage you to know about that if you prescribe them or even if you don't, because it's really important to know there that the, they increase the risk of death among people who have dementia. All right, I've gone a little bit longer than I wanted, but uh, that's great. So thank you for all the fantastic questions along the way. I'd be glad to, uh, to take more of them. This is my contact information. Please feel free to email me or call me. I'd, I'd love to uh, hear your thoughts, especially if there was anything I said that seemed off base. I, we'd love to, uh, to, to correct it. Um, and uh, I, I, the, uh, the article about the blood test, I can uh, track that down. There has been more recent information I heard from the fellow today uh, that there was another test approved for, uh, for dementia that I, based on what he told me, I'm, I'm still a little uh, skeptical of. Uh, but if you just e email me, I can send you the uh, information about that other one that had 90% accuracy. And I, uh, I hope that uh, this has been a good introduction to the series. And I know that the, the rest of the, the talks are gonna be uh, really in interesting and informative and uh, will help you to uh, deal with all of the, the patients you have who have dementia. Thanks so much, Dr. Thielke. This was just, as usual, outstanding and very helpful. And if you want to send me um, the article information, I can make sure that attendees get the citation. Um, like I can throw it into the chat box next week or whatever. Oh, great. Sounds good. So, and there, there yeah. was a question about lecanemab. Um, that's the, the new uh, drug that the FDA approved. Uh, so I, I'd encourage you, if, if you're curious about that, to you know, really look at the uh, details. Uh, so it was effective at reducing plaques as they could measure them. But in terms of the outcomes that mattered to patients, uh, it was far more questionable. So that is uh, really the, the crux of dementia care or dementia treatments, pharmaceutical treatments is, are you able to produce a drug that generates outcomes that matter for the patients and their families instead of measuring a level of a protein in their bodies? We have and drugs like, that will change the level of proteins in their bodies, uh, but we don't have ones that will consistently change the, the patient-related outcomes. And will you be covering covering some of those updates when you do your February 21st geriatric yes, great, pharmacotherapy? Great, 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 great point, Barb. I will be uh, readdressing that uh, in February uh, when we talk more about the medications. And the, the question from Linda about how it got approved is, is fascinating. Um, we had, I went to a, a talk by somebody who was kind of on the inside of the process and it was uh, really a, a fascinating process, uh, even though it, it makes you wonder about how the FDA decided to approve it. So obviously uh, it'd be great to uh, have a, a treatment that would work for dementia. I would, I would love to have it but we have to make sure that we're not selling false promises. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna put this um, these links one more time. Um, there's oh, yeah. a link to the evaluation survey if you folks wouldn't mind filling that out, we'd really appreciate it. Um, Stephen, again, thank you so much for the great lecture and everyone, thanks for coming to our first lecture of the series and I hope I'll see most of you, at least EC most of you next week. EC, I like it, EC. <laughs>